This is the story of the North American XB-70 Valkyrie, a Mach 3 bomber built to dominate the Soviet Union and outpace any defense. Compared to the SR-71 Blackbird's Mach 3.3, the Valkyrie's Mach 3.1 was no slouch. Yeah, just Mach 3.1. Hauling a massive payload was the difference, though, between the XB-70 Valkyrie and the SR-71. And the Valkyrie could carry that massive payload while screaming across the skies. This beast was built to go long and hard, leaving the competition in the dust. It was powered by six General Electric YJ-93 engines. It had a Delta wing and cutting edge tech for its day. It was a Cold War icon. What missions could it have flown? Some people say it was only in testing, but could this thing have actually flown missions? We'll be getting into that in this video. Did it undertake secret operations? Because as we've seen, certain aircraft have been operational prior to them actually being released to the public. But how did the Soviets counter this thing? Check out this graphic footage of the Valkyrie from Mustard. You can see those six engines. What a beautiful six engine design. Watching this thing fly across the sky was a marvel. This is a beast of epic proportions and nothing has really come close since. In this video, I'll be reviewing images and videos of this beast. And at the end, I'll give you my overall fighter pilot take. So make sure you stay to the end of the video to hear my final wrap up. And at the end, we'll talk about the accident that made this program shut down. In the late 1950s, the US Air Force needed a bomber to outmatch the Soviet threat. The XB-70 Valkyrie was built by North American Aviation. It could hit Mach 3.1. That's just a 2,056 mile per hour top speed, and it could get there at 73 thousand feet, just shy of the SR-71's Mach 3.3 Sprint. This 242-ton, 196 foot long aircraft was powered by six YJ-93 turbojets. Each one of those things pumped out 28,800 pounds of thrust. Those engines had more thrust than your buddy's late night bar bragging session where he's telling you how awesome he is. Its delta wings with folding tips used compression lift to ride its own shockwave and that would reduce drag at those enhanced speeds. The Valkyrie's titanium skin and stainless steel honeycomb panels withstood supersonic heat, pioneering materials that later informed the SR-71 Blackbird's design. So the lessons learned from the XB-70 Valkyrie helped create the SR-71. Conceived after the XB-70, the SR-71 borrowed the Valkyrie's titanium expertise to handle Mach 3 plus temperatures, while its sleeker airframe drew on lessons from the XB-70's high altitude stability challenges. But both of these planes tackled the same thermal and aerodynamic demons, but with the Valkyrie's heavy lift design, it set the stage for the Blackbird's recon agility. But the technology was revolutionary for the time. This XB-70 had a retractable windshield ramp for low speed visibility where the windshield would come down so the pilots could see better, and then at top speeds, it would flush with the fuselage to allow for that supersonic airflow to happen more smoothly. Back to the XB-70 in a minute, I want to introduce you to today's video part partner REC watches and specifically the X4009 series. It's a limited edition tribute from an actual Spitfire MK1A number X4009. This aircraft is a Battle of Britain legend. It was actually flown by Australia's ace Patterson Clarence Hughes. Tragically Hughes and aircraft X4009 were shot down on September 7th, 1940. Hughes was a top gun level ace, but in dogfights and fighter aviation, eventually the margin for error becomes so small that anything can happen. But aluminum from X4009's wreckage that can't be restored on the actual aircraft is reborn and it's used in the six o'clock subdial of these Swiss made timepieces. It's just incredible that there's actual aluminum from a Spitfire in every watch. These watches are also crafted with World War II dirty dozen spirit. The X4009 boasts bold numerals, a ribbon spar crown guard, and a Spitfire engraved rotor. Part of every sale fuels the Hunter Fighter Collection's mission to restore X4009 to flight. So owning an X4009 is more than owning a watch. It's becoming a part of the mission to bring this historic aircraft back to life. And that's just epic. My favorite is the Hunter green version, but there's also a gray, blue, and black, which are awesome as well. So learn more about this restoration and check out the X4009 watch by clicking the link in the description of this video. Now back to the XB70 Valkyrie. And this thing had crew escape capsules for Mach 3 plus ejections. This jet was not built for just running drills. This is the real deal. And it had systems on it that could get it deep into Soviet territory and strike wherever it wanted to. This thing was not a drill. This was the real thing. I'm back. 
The Valkyrie's mission was to penetrate Soviet defenses, deliver a 10,000 pound nuclear payload, and exit at Mach 3.1, nearly matching the SR-71's elusive speed. At 70,000 feet, it could outrun MiG-19s and MiG-21s, crossing continents before radar operators could even react. It could slip through defenses like a guy trying to dodge a long conversation with his mother-in-law. We've all been there, man, it's cool. Air Force proposals from 1959 outlined its use as a recon strike platform to target Soviet rail mobile ICBM missiles, and those missiles were hidden on moving trains. Officially, the program was canceled in 1961 because it was deemed too costly at $700 million per unit, and it was deemed to be vulnerable to new defenses built by the Soviets. But speculation persists about classified missions that could have taken place before this program was shut down. Could the Valkyrie have flown covert ops over the Soviet Union, testing air defenses or gathering intel on missile sites? Its capabilities suggest it could slip through radar nets undetected. While records are silent, the potential for black missions fuels a lot of intrigue behind this program. And as we know, there's been jets that have been in combat before and then have later been released to the public. So is it plausible that this thing could have flown combat missions, specifically recon combat missions? I would say it's definitely plausible and testing the electronics in this jet with real defenses is probably the best way to make sure that it can slip through those defenses. But the Soviets weren't having it. They knew that this thing was a real threat. So they began to counter it with the S-75 Devena, NATO's SA-2 guideline, a surface to air missile that could hit Mach 3 targets above 70,000 feet. It was unveiled in 1957 and it downed a U-2 spy plane in 1960, proving it could challenge the Valkyrie's high altitude flight. And since the SA-2 could reach so high, it became plausible Plausible that the SA-2's radar could lock onto the XB-70's large cross-section, and then those missiles could just stay tuned in and lock on like a stage five clinger. I'm never letting you go, Valkyrie. God, don't ever leave me. Ever. Good, because I'd find you. <laughs> Low-level flight was an option, but the Valkyrie's wings weren't optimized for it. This jet was built for high-altitude, high-speed flights. So there was basically one regime of flight where the Valkyrie could actually be successful. And once these Soviet missiles could reach up there and touch it, it became clear that the Valkyrie might be outdated. And then the MiG-25 Foxbat was developed in the 60s. It could reach Mach 2.83 and 67,000 feet. It was armed with R-40 missiles to engage targets just like the the Valkyrie and the SR-71. Though it was slower than the SR-71 or the XB-70, the MiG-25 forced the US to rethink high altitude strategies. Soviet defenses evolved to counter America's speed advantage, and it was clear that since that Soviet jet, the MiG-25 could get up so high and then launch an R-40 missile that continuing the XB-70 program just didn't really make sense. And the Soviets did have some comparisons, although not a direct competitor with the XB-70, they did build some things that were very similar. The Soviets built the Sukhoi T-4 and they codenamed it the Sokka. It was a Mach 3 bomber that was built to rival the Valkyrie. It was a smaller aircraft, but it was designed to deliver nuclear cruise missiles that were launched at 80,000 feet. Its droop nose and delta wings mirrored the XB-70. Weird, the Soviets mirroring a Western jet? No, that's the first time and that's ever happened, but it had four Kolosov RD3641 engines and it had shockwave riding intakes similar to the XB-70. But at this point, the Soviets didn't even care that it looked similar to the XB-70. They just felt the need. They felt that need for speed and nothing was gonna stop them from designing a similar aircraft. But the T-4 aimed to penetrate US airspace for strikes or reconnaissance, similar to what the XB-70 was built to do to the Soviets. So while the T-4 was the Soviets' closest attempt to match the Valkyrie, other designs like the Tupolev Tu-160 and 2144 that reveal their broader response to America's supersonic ambitions with their bombers. The 2160 Blackjack, that's a Mach 2.05 strategic bomber that was developed in the 1970s, and it prioritized range and payload over the XB-70s, blistering Mach 3.1 speed, and that 2160 is still in use today. It is more of a strategic nuclear bomber, but it can also deliver conventional payloads, and it's been seen being used in the Ukraine-Russia war. And that 2160 
160 is said to be able to carry up to 88,000 pounds of ordnance over 7,600 miles. Its variable sweeped wings and four NK32 engines made it a versatile successor to the T4. It's still flying today like we talked about. Unlike the XB70's retirement, they kept that thing going. The 2144 was a Mach 2 civilian supersonic transport from the 1960s, and that pushed Soviet aerodynamic expertise with its delta wing and droop nose, much like the Valkyrie or even the Concorde, but its commercial role diverged from the XB-70's military mission. Both the 2160 and 2144 lacked the Valkyrie's extreme high altitude speed, but it reflected the Soviets' relentless drive to counter US aerospace dominance with their own technological leaps. It was essentially a supersonic high altitude bomber arms race, and the XB-70, in my opinion, led that entire arms race. But why was the Valkyrie named the Valkyrie? The name wasn't just a cool label, it was a battle cry. In Norse mythology, Valkyries were fierce maidens who soared over battlefields, choosing warriors for Valhalla's glory. That's just pretty awesome. North American Aviation picked this name in 1957 to evoke unstoppable power, a Mach 3 angel of death delivering nuclear might. That's just epic. The Valkyries reveal sent the Kremlin into a frenzy. Soviet intelligence scrambled as spy reports of a 2,000 mile per hour bomber leaked out capable of striking Moscow before their MiGs could scramble or even know it was airborne. The XB-70's massive radar signature and 70,000 foot altitude forced the Soviets to pour billions into the S-75 Divina Sam and MiG-25 Foxbat. Desperate to counter this titanium titan, they dumped as much as they could into those programs. Whispers of its test flights sparked panic in Soviet war rooms, fearing it could expose their mobile ICBMs or even buzz the Kremlin in a show of American dominance. The Valkyrie wasn't just a plane, it was a a psychological warfare titan, a symbol of US supremacy that kept Soviet generals awake at night. But on June 8, 1966, the Valkyrie's story turned into a heart-pounding nightmare, a mid-air collision that rocked the aviation world and left a scar on the Mojave Desert. It was meant to be a routine General Electric photo shoot showcasing the XB-70's Mach 3 Majesty alongside a T-38 Talon F-4 Phantom, F-4 Tiger, and an F-104 Starfighter, all powered by GE engines. Flying in tight formation at 25,000 feet over Barstow, California, the group cruised at around 300 knots. Knots. Cameras were rolling to capture the Valkyrie's sleek titanium skin, but then disaster struck like a lightning bolt. And here's this video from Mike Bell. I'm gonna play it and react to it as the video plays out. So you can see the formation flying tight, but the F-104 piloted by Joseph Walker is flying tighter in to the XB-70 Valkyrie. And here is a great depiction of that wake turbulence that is flowing off of the Valkyrie, probably unlike any other aircraft at the time. And here's the view from the cockpit. As you can see, flying extremely tight to that Valkyrie with their wing right there is not a good position to be in as a fighter pilot. And then air traffic control is gonna call out a B-58 that is flying at the time of collision up high above the formation. You can see the F-104 Starfighter is parked in tight. And it's rumored that potentially the pilot of the F-104 looked up, saw the B-58, which is definitely plausible, and as this is happening, they got closer and closer and there was no room for error. And then that vortex is gonna suck in the F-104. This is a great depiction of that. I felt vortexes like this while flying on the Thunderbirds. I've flown tight formation with large aircraft, with F-22s, with bombers, B-1s aircraft that have different profiles of that vortex. And as you can see, that vortex is gonna rip in the Starfighter right there. The pilot is pretty much gonna die instantly as the Starfighter hits the vertical stabilizers of the XB-70. The formation is gonna scatter. There is an actual depiction, actual photo right there of the F-104. It was taken by a Learjet, which was the chase jet taking photos, and then a T-38 pilot that is flying is gonna call midair, and then the Valkyrie is essentially destroyed. At this point, it's gonna continue for about 16 seconds straight and level, and then it's gonna go into an uncommanded roll. At this point, one of the pilots is gonna bail out, and it's actually gonna get inside that capsule as the bailout happens. One of the pilots on board isn't gonna have time to get in their capsule, and it's just so different from any ejection from an, any other bomber or fighter that it's probably counterintuitive on how to actually eject and get out of this thing. And the centrifugal forces 
coming off of this type of a spin are gonna disorient any pilot. So that might be one of the reasons why one of the pilots isn't able to get out. It's just gonna be such a different mindset to get into. And as you can see, tucking back in to that capsule is gonna be extremely challenging. And in this case, the pilot that gets back into that capsule actually gets one of their elbows caught and it keeps the actual door from closing on the capsule. Very unfortunate, but luckily that one pilot is able to get out. There's a cushion on the bottom of the capsule and that cushion doesn't inflate because the door is not closed. So the capsule is gonna hit at 32 Gs, causing extreme damage to that pilot's body, but luckily they did survive. As you can see, that XB70 tumbling like that unfortunately kills the entire program. Almost a billion dollar aircraft going down in a tragic incident like this is gonna make everybody question whether or not this is worth it. But as a Thunderbird pilot myself, having flown in formation with multiple large aircraft, the vortexes that come off of those jets make it to where you have to have a margin for safety. You have to have a little more distance. So the fact that the F-104 pilot was flying in tight like that, I get it. Joe Walker, NASA's chief test pilot. He's one of the top test pilots, one of the top formation pilots in the world, but he's gonna get a little bit too tight. And when you're doing a photo shoot, you wanna be tight, you wanna be precise, you wanna show off the aviation prowess of the United States. But in this case, keeping that distance, when it wasn't known what those vortexes would do in a formation flight, you need to keep more of a distance from that jet. I've flown supersonic formation with other Thunderbird jets, and we made sure that we stayed tight, but not too tight, so we had a little bit of a buffer, a little bit of room for error. This wasn't a supersonic flight when the XB-70 went down, but when when I did that supersonic flight with that formation of Thunderbirds, we made sure that we had buffer and distance because we didn't know what the flight characteristics and the flight profile would be of six Thunderbird jets flying supersonic together. I noticed a little bit of a bow wave, a little bit of a shock wave that actually pushed me away from the fighter in front of me. But as you can see in this case, the actual bow wave coming off of the XB-70 is gonna create that whirlwind type scenario where the F-104 is gonna be pulled in and pushed over the top of the fuselage of the XB-70 in that tragic incident. There were also situations with the XB-70 where a circuit breaker popped and didn't allow the nose gear to come all the way up. So the XB-70 circled over the Mojave Desert for hours trying to get that nose gear down. One of the test pilots used their ingenuity and basically popped the circuit breaker with a paper clip, allowing that nose gear to come down. The only catch was that circuit breaker seized the brakes on the main landing gear. So as the XB-70 touched down, it touched down to seized brakes, which then caused a massive fire, but the pilots were able to save the jet. But these were the kind of issues that the XB-70 program was running into. So that incident, piled on top of the actual accident itself, caused the program to be canceled, unfortunately. What do you think of the XB-70? Do you think it flew missions prior to it being put to rest and prior to that last prototype being put in a museum? I'd love to hear your thoughts. Let me know in the comments below what you think of the XB-70. And the best compliment you can give the channel is just watch this video right here. It'll help the channel out a ton, it'll help the channel grow, and I would greatly appreciate it. So I'll see you on this video right here. This is Ryan, also known as Max Afterburner, also known as the fighter pilot next door, signing off.